Good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, so, hope you enjoyed uh, the previous uh, previous talk. This talk will be about software protection. So, basic question that we have today is: uh, if we're building software, and once we have built software, uh, and we're deploying it in mass to the to the to the to the broader uh, to, to the clients or whatever, what can we do to actually protect the software that you have been built? That's the basic question that, we, that we're going to try to answer uh, today in this session. Okay, uh, a brief uh, few words about ourselves. Uh, we're both working uh, at PwC, uh, doing all sorts of services around uh, software security and security in general. Uh, we actually both have uh, academic backgrounds uh, at KU Leuven, um, doing research in uh, software security, cryptography, and, and uh, other, other um, uh, other activities in that. Um, Want to add something to that, Nesim? Covered everything. It's so good. So that's Nesim. I'm Bart. The picture should speak for itself, right? Hopefully. Uh, okay. Um, so the agenda for today, well, the talk will consist of three parts. First of all, we will try to explain a bit what's the motivation behind this. What do we, what do we want to reach? Why why do we want to protect this software? Uh, discussing a bit the threats, attack vectors, and different types of characteristics of the, of the controls that might be used for that purpose. And then the main uh, part of the talk uh, will be about actual controls that you can implement to protect the software. Uh, so we have quite a list of uh, controls that we will be discussing. Uh, we won't be discussing every control because we don't have enough time. Uh, there, the, there's a lot of information in the slides which will be available. So for the controls that we don't discuss today, um, you, can, uh, you can also already uh, have a look at the slides afterwards. Um, also, if there are, we will uh, discuss a number of controls. If you would like to see discussion on other controls, we can, of course, uh, switch what we're what we, what we discussing. We have the slides for that. But we, we, will be define, we will be discussing a set of controls that we think are the most relevant to be discussing today. And then in the last part, we will be uh, do, doing some general discussion on how can you best use these controls, what are potential uh, advantages, drawbacks, what, what should you take into account in, in, in using these in using these software uh, controls, in just software protection controls? So the main part of the talk will be on the on the second part. Okay, setting the scene. So the basic question that we would like to answer is: once software has been built, has been written, has been developed, what can the manufacturer of the software do within the same software to protect it against abuse? There are a number of important uh, keywords here that are actually setting the scope of the things that we're going to discuss today. First of all, we're talking about the manufacturer of software, not the client using the software. So the idea is what can a company that is building and shipping software, what can that company do to actually protect uh, the software against illegal use, against hampering uh, the client of that, that is using that software, against all forms of attacks on that software, on that piece of software. And we'll discuss in a, in a few minutes what can potential misuses of software actually mean. Uh, second of all, uh, we're talking about uh, controls within the software or surrounding the software. So the, the focus of the talk of today won't be on uh, hardware-driven uh, schemes or hardware-supported schemes for doing software protection. We want to focus discussion mainly on how can you change the software or, to, or what augmented uh, controls can you implement in the software to protect that software? Of course, that has a number of limitations and we'll be discussing these limitations as well. Um, okay. So why do we need such protection? Uh, is, it, is it necessary in the first place? If you are building software as a company and you're, suppose that you're Microsoft or a bank or whatever organization that's building software, there's a lot of things that can happen to the software once you ship it to the customer. For instance, um, you have, I have a pointer here, I think, yeah, okay. Uh, for instance, software that. Um, you're shipping the software uh, and you, you're hoping, uh, if in, in, in case of payable software, that only the people that are actually paying for the software are using that software. And all other people are actually not using the software. Software theft. So you want to avoid that uh, the software is being uh, distributed um, to people not paying for software and used by those people not paying for your <coughs> software. 
um, intellectual property theft. Your software might contain a number of um, um, IP-related uh, algorithms that you want to protect and that you don't want to distribute to the entire, to the entire world. But of course, they are in, included in your software. So somehow, you need to find a way to actually protect those, uh, in, that intellectual property that's contained in the software while still shipping the software to the customer. Uh, you could have uh, malicious software. So once you're uh, shipping a piece of software, it might be the case that actually attackers are changing the software that you ship uh, slightly changing it to include, I don't know, whatever, backdoors or other kinds of malicious uh, uh, code in there and actually reshape the software to the entire audience. Um, it's a, a very relevant threat uh, nowadays with, with all the, uh, malicious, uh, the mobile applications going around. You have these uh, app stores. Uh, it, it, it happens quite often that, act act that attackers are actually downloading a particular um, pieces of software, changing it slightly, and then resubmitting it to the App Store in the hope that actually non-suspecting users are, are, are downloading that software and, and would be start, start using that software. Of course, then, then all, um, all bad things can, can happen. Uh, <clears throat> you also want to avoid that software is actually being um, used as an attack vector to actually attack the client. Um, if your software would contain a number of vulnerabilities in there uh, that you are not aware of, or that you uh, are impossible to fix by, by some restrictions, uh, by some by some uh, circumstances in, in your organization, you, you want to avoid that so software is actually being used as an attack vector to attack the client, meaning that you want to make it harder to, to, to analyze the software and to identify the potential vulnerabilities in the software that can, that, that can then later be exploited uh, to, to attack the client. And then um, software typically contains a number of uh, secrets that you want to that that you need uh, secrets uh, credentials for instance to connect make connections to backends uh, secrets to do secret computations these kind of things uh, these secrets often are part of the software and you you want to make sure of course that these secrets are properly protected once you ship the software to the to the customer to the client okay clear um, some real world examples of this. Um, the reverse engineering software to steal uh, uh, intellectual property is something that happens quite, uh, quite often uh, that you definitely want to, to protect against, that you might want to protect against. Uh, in terms of the, the mobile banking, for instance, uh, we've, uh, we've worked quite a bit with, with uh, banks in Belgium and we see that they're doing all sorts of um, activities in trying to protect the software that is being shipped to the client to make sure that you have some sort of assurance that the software that you ship to the client is actually the software that you have been built, that you have built uh, within the organization. Um, we'll be discussing the, the, the controls for, for uh, protecting that software uh, in, in this session. Now, it might be interesting to, talk, to think about a bit about what are the, the threat agents in this, in this picture. What, what are actually the, the people that might want to attack you as a, as a software manufacturer in, in, this, in, this, in this picture? What would be the typical uh, agents attacking attacking the, the the software model in that sense? Can you can you think of some? Who would want, who would have interest in attacking trying to attack the software that you ship to the customer? Customer itself, customer itself right? Why? Because you might get extra benefits by abusing the software. Yeah, yeah. Or you might distribute the software and like sell it, for instance, these kind of things. Definitely one. Yeah. Do we, do we see others? Competitors. Yeah, definitely. And the intellectual property theft is typically done by competitors. Yeah. Criminal organizations. Yeah. They might want to uh, analyze the software, try to identify vulnerabilities in there to exploit, <coughs> to exploit there. Yeah, <coughs> definitely. Others? Seen others? Yeah, governmental organizations very important. Uh, it happens it happens all too often that there are activities in that in that domain going on as well. Any other things that we see? I, I think we've covered the, the, the main ones. Eh? But just just to make out the point that the type of threat agent that's that's trying to attack the software that you're shipping can be quite different. And so also the, the protection mechanisms or protection controls that you want to put in place 
also will have to make sure that you cover the different, uh, the different powers or the different capabilities that the different threat agents have in attacking that software. Okay? Um, so, looking at software in general, uh, suppose um, um, this is software being, this is a static representation of software, this is the client side, uh, so the client executing software, this is the vendor side. Uh, the vendor side typically also executing part of, part of the software. This is a static representation of the software, so the code that's being written. This is the dynamic representation of the software, so the execu actual execution of the software. And in the execution of the software, you typically, of course, have an application-specific uh, component. It might be at both sides that's running this component. And then you have a platform, a platform uh, below. So it might be, first of all, application middleware that is running, and then some hardware platform that's actually executing your software. Um, so giving, uh, taking this into account, the, um, the software control, the protection controls that we're going to talk about today are mainly focused here on this part. So we won't be talking too much about the underlying platforms. There's a lot of protection uh, techniques available that are changing the underlying uh, execution platform, both in software or in hardware, to try to increase assurance in the software that's being executed. That won't be fo the focus of the topic uh, of, the, of the talk today. The, to the focus will be really on this level. So within the software, what can you do to actually change or increase protection of the, of the software? Okay, clear? Okay, is this useful? Very interesting question. Uh, because actually, um, if you only work at the software level and you don't take into account the underlying execution platform, if you cannot trust the underlying execution platform, it is in, in practice very hard and actually it's fundamentally impossible to uh, fully secure uh, the, the, the threats against the software. If you're implementing like a license scheme and you're executing particular statements in that license scheme, but you actually don't know uh, which of the statements that you're executing are being executed or not by the underlying platform. Suppose the underlying platform would actually skip out 50% of the statements that you're doing for the license scheme. It's very hard to actually implement something or uh, fundamentally impossible to implement something um, that can actually, that, that, that gives you 100% security on the fact that this, this protection mechanism is, is working. So it's a, it's a theoretical problem. We cannot make guarantees about the fact that it's working or not. Now, does that mean that it doesn't make sense to do this? Not at all. Uh, it does definitely have, uh, have, uh, make sense to implement these software-only protection techniques under the condition that, first of all, they are well scoped and targeted so that you don't want to protect um, against any kind of possible threats, but you, that really focus very much on what, what type, the type of threats that you want to focus, that you want to protect against. And also, they make a lot of sense because they typically, all the, most of the techniques that we talk about, they reasonably prolong the time to break the protection, to, to, to break the software. So what they do is they just make it harder for the attacker to actually execute the threat that they want, want on the software. If you're talking about uh, analyzing the intellectual property in the software, if you would just transform the application so that, so that the analyzing becomes much harder, which is called obfuscation, we'll talk about that, then it doesn't protect it because the attacker just needs more time to analyze the software, but it, it, made, it, made, it, it is the case that it will be, become more difficult for the attacker. And in practice, that is actually often sufficient. So that's the reason why actually these techniques are, are very useful in practice to, to implement, but from a theoretical perspective, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't give you always the guarantees that you're looking for. Okay? Clear? Okay. So looking uh, again at threats and uh, uh, protection uh, mechanisms that, that we have, in general we can actually um, distinguish four different threats uh, to software. First of all, there's a threat of unauthorized, unauthorized analysis. So an attacker is trying to analyze what the software is doing and try to figure out, uh, uh, wants, to seal, uh, wants to seal an intellectual property, wants to know how the software is working in order to maybe later on uh, implement an attack on that, on that running software. That's unauthorized analysis. Unauthorized modification is you're trying to change the software and then, for, for instance, upon distribution of, so, of, of the software to the clients, make sure that there's some extra malicious behavior implemented in or in, inserted into that software. 
That's unauthorized modification. Unauthorized copying, you're shipping software and you want to avoid that the software or the data that comes with the software is copied to other uh, client, potential clients that are actually not authorized uh, to use that software. And the last one is unauthorized use. You're actually making sure that once, this, once um, software or data is copied to an, an, another client, to, to a third party, making sure that he cannot use the software if he's not entitled to. Clear? Okay, so we have a number of controls for each of these threads. And what we will do actually in the rest of the talk is discuss uh, quite a lot of, uh, quite a number of these controls in, in some more detail. Huh? We won't be discussing all the technical details of these controls, we won't have that time, but we will try to give you an idea of what is the control, what is the goal, uh, is it a uh, theoretical exercise or is it practically feasible to do these kind of things and what are the advantages and disadvantages of using these type of controls. Okay, before we go there, a few more words about uh, characteristics of uh, these controls. Um, I'm sorry for that, some of the um, uh, slide uh, fall off the screen. Um, this says um, attack and this says protect, just for your information. You can actually um, look at the software protection techniques from software development lifecycle. So if you have a typical software development lifecycle, you would start with requirements analysis, uh, architectural design or design, uh, and then you would come uh, slowly into implementation, some testing typically, uh, yeah, implementation, build some testing somewhere, and then you would start distributing, executing the software, and updating the software, so maintaining the software. Now, it's, inter it's interesting to see where actually the attacks are uh, taking place and where the protection mechanisms are taking place. And first, what, what the first uh, clear uh, thing to, uh, to, uh, to say here is that um, if you look at the protection uh, techniques, they typically are implemented earlier on in the life cycle than actually the attacks. If you're doing an attack on an unauthorized copy, you typically want a protection mechanism that is implemented before the distribution phase, right? Uh, and in this case, an authorized copy, there would be like watermarking, for instance, to prevent that, and watermarking would typically be implemented in the build phase for the software, right? Um, and then it's the um, same holds for an authorized tampering, uh, at the update phase, so if you're, if you're uh, distributing a patch for your software, you want to make sure that the patch is not tampered with. Uh, the unauthorized tampering attack would occur in the update phase, while uh, protecting against that, for instance, by means of code signing, would be in the distribution phase. So you always have the attack, the, the protection mechanism, implementing in the lifecycle before the actual attacks take place. Of course, it makes sense, but uh, second thing, what's important on this slide is the, the place or the phase in which you actually implement the software protection uh, technique actually uh, um, is different in the, in the software lifecycle. Uh, a code signing technique you would typically do in the distribution phase, while a licensing scheme you should start thinking about licensing in the implementation phase. So also there, depending on the, scheme, the, 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 depending on the protection technique that you want to implement, you might have to uh, think in different phases in the software development lifecycle to implement it actually. Okay, second thing, uh, second characteristic about these uh, protection techniques is um, actually the techniques, um, a lot of these techniques uh, um, have communication between the vendor and the client. So there is some piece of software running at the client side and there is some piece of software running at the vendor side. And actually uh, these techniques, you have different types of techniques. Uh, some of these techniques, which we call zero way, there is actually no execution, communication during the execution of the platform to uh, enforce the particular protection technique. So wh when you're running the software, the software will not call up to the call uh, into the vendor to provide it with information or get additional information from the vendor in order to implement or execute the protection technique. One way uh, is the fact that um, Either the vendor is sending information to the client or vice versa. The, vi the client is sending information to the vendor, but there's no uh, multi-way multi communication going on. It's a one-step communication. Then you have two-way protection techniques. Typically, you have uh, kind of a challenge response system. You, someone, uh, like for instance, the client is sending some piece of information to the vendor, and the vendor respond, respond, does a transformation on that piece of information, and is responding to the client with another piece of information that can then be used. 
This can go again in both ways. Eh? It can be the client that's taking the initiative to send information or it can be the vendor that's taking the initiative to, to send the information. And then what you will see in, in a number of these techniques, there's actually n-way communication going on, meaning that for all of these two-way communications, you can actually apply them consist, uh, continuously. So you can uh, do that, like say, every, every five minutes to make sure that the, the, the software is always running in a correct state and you can do that continuously. Then these two-way uh, systems often become n-way and there's actually continuous communication going on. Uh, I don't know, uh, it, it would be a useful exercise uh, for you to, to, to try to, to see what software on your PC is doing, but I, I, I would give you the advice, uh, t take your uh, personal laptop or, or your workstation at, at your enterprise, uh, run a sniffer on that, on that machine and try to see what's going on there and what software is doing all this, all this type of communication towards the vendor. You actually would be surprised to see what amount of communication is going on in these, in these softwares to, uh, in, in for reason of protection or for other reasons uh, uh, for that matter. It's, it's a very, a very very interesting exercise. And even if you, look at, if you would look at standard browsers, for instance, without doing any, any browsing, there's a lot of uh, traffic going on back and forth uh, within these browsers. Okay? That was the motivation and introduction. Any questions on this? Is it clear what we're trying to achieve? Any remarks for, this, for that matter? Not really? Okay, let's then go to the, to the discussion of the controls itself. Um, maybe as an overview, what we've, di what we've done is we've, uh, we will be discussing per thread uh, two controls that we selected that we think are most interesting, most relevant to discuss here today. Uh, if there are particular, that also means that during the presentation we'll be skipping some slides. If there are particular techniques that you say, oh, this really interests me and I would like to see more, just raise your hand or yell and we can, we can discuss it. Eh? But we won't have the time, uh, I'm afraid, to discuss all of the, of the protection techniques in more, in more detail. Okay, for um, unauthorized analysis, I'll start off with uh, uh, obfuscation. The structure of the presentation for these controls is, is uh, a, a similar for most of the controls, meaning that uh, we all uh, start off with general explication, uh, what it is, what is the goal, these kind of things. Uh, and in that, we also always list a number of characteristics of these uh, protection techniques. I'll briefly explain what they are. So first of all, um, one of the characteristics, what's the network interaction model that these protection techniques has? Is it zero way, one way, two way or n way? Explain before what that means. Second one is, what's the typical phase where, would, where you would uh, implement this protection technique? So where in the software development lifecycle we would actually have to do particular actions in order to implement the technique in your software? In this case, it could be in the build phase. Uh, is it commercially available or not? You will see that for some of these techniques, it's actually academic research and there's no commercial uh, implementations available yet. So if you're thinking in terms of a, an organization applying these techniques, it will become, of course, more difficult when there's no commercial uh, products available. Uh, is it specific to a particular technology? There are some techniques that are uh, very specific to a particular technology or language, while others are actually more technology independent. Also there, we, um, we try to make that difference. And then we have two things um, that uh, are relevant when you, want, when you think about applying it in a, in a particular, in a practical organization. First of all, how complex is it from a technical perspective? So what, what do you as an organization have to do to implement it and how technically complex is that? Is it easy to just uh, install a piece of software and you're done? Or do you have to configure a lot of things? Or do you have to start uh, implementing your own compilers? I don't know, so these, these kind of things these kind of uh, discussions. So there we just say low, medium, high to give you an indication of how complex it is. And then also the implementation cost. As an organization, how much would it typically cost to implement this kind of control? Also there, low, medium and high. We don't give exact figures, of course, uh, but just again to give you an indication of that particular technique. Okay, that is clear? Perfect. So obfuscation as a first technique. What, what is obfuscation? Obfuscation actually tries to protect against uh, unauthorized um, analysis of software. So you're trying to make sure that the source code that you're actually shipping to the client, that it becomes difficult for humans to actually read the source code. 
So in typical example would be JavaScript. If you have a web application and you would include, you have an Ajax application for instance, it will contain a lot of JavaScript. JavaScript is just sent in, in, in plain text, in clear text to the, to the, to the client. So if there would be uh, algorithms in there, there that you want to protect from, um, from, the, from the customer, that you want, don't want the customer to see, you would use this kind of technique like obfuscation. Um, have you ever looked at um, um, Google or, um, I don't know, Facebook uh, or, or these, these kinds of applications? Have you ever actually looked one time to the JavaScript that they are sending to you? You should do it once. It's an interesting exercise. I've once, uh, for instance, tried to, to, to look into Google Analytics. They have small pieces of uh, JavaScript that you, put, that you have to put in your site. <coughs> Try to figure out what the JavaScript does. It's, uh, it's, it's fully obfuscated, you won't, you won't understand a thing of what's, what's written there. It's, uh, but you should have a look. A lot of the uh, modern uh, software companies are using obfuscation techniques for web applications because actually in, in, uh, in using JavaScript, a lot of the sources are actually shipped to the client. And in some cases you want to, you want to protect that. Yeah? They're doing both uh, in some sense, but indeed, you're right. But I'll, I'll come back to the difference later, but you're right, exactly, yeah. Um, so you can do obfuscation on, a different, uh, on different types of languages. Uh, you can do it on uh, scripting languages, like the JavaScript example that I gave you. You can do it on uh, languages that have intermediate bytecode representations, so that are not binary languages, but are with intermediate uh, representations like Java or .NET or these type of languages. And you can also do it on binaries. There are, there are tools available that do also obfuscation on, on binaries uh, for that matter. Um, so what do they do? They take as input uh, the source that you provide them, and uh, source between, between quotes because it can be binary, but they, they take that as input, and ju they just apply transformations on that source to make sure that it becomes more hard to, to analyze the software. And of course, this uh, transformation has to be semantic preserving, so when you execute a piece of software, it has to do the exact same thing as before. But the structure and, the, the structure and how it looks can totally change. Um, so, as I said before, it's uh, typically applied in the build phase, so in the, in the latest stages of the, of the software uh, development lifecycle. Okay, um, if we would like, would look at obfuscation techniques, there are a number of techniques that actually these tools are using to try to uh, hide what software is actually doing. So, a very simple one, and the early obfuscators did this, uh, for uh, mainly this, is name obfuscation. So, you just take the piece of software, and all the variable names or all the function names, you just change them into something arbitrary. And by doing that, it becomes already more, more difficult to, 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 re to reason. Uh, you can do screen, string encryption. So, you can actually change or, or uh, s secure the content of the strings that are actually in your piece of software in order to. Uh, hide out the secrets that, that might be hidden in your, in your application. You can also play with the control flow of your, of your, of your software, meaning that so you have different functions calling each other, and you can actually try to change how these functions are calling each other, while again still preserving the semantics of the, of the ring and application. Uh, you can also do code virtualization, meaning that you translate the code in something uh, that's being executed in, in terms of a a virtual uh, runtime within the, within the software, uh, meaning that so the, the exact statements that are there are not statements that will be executed by the normal running platform, but by a virtual platform that's in, embedded into your software. And of course, you can then define what that virtual platform is, and you can do whatever you want to do with the statements in your application, in your software. Okay, one example of uh, uh, obfuscation control flow flattening. Uh, so an example, it, I, I'm afraid that maybe not all the statements will be readable in the back, but that, don't worry, it's not important to, to see that. What's important to see is, uh, here you have a piece of code with actually a control flow graph like this one. So you have uh, starting, you have uh, assignments, and then you have an iteration uh, going on, and then the algorithm stops, right? What control flattening does is actually it breaks up um, the control flow or the, the, the different parts of the statements in multiple, in multiple cases. So for instance here, uh, it will break up the inner, the inner loop in three different cases and actually it will uh, iterate constantly over these three different cases. 
Um, so you will see that, for instance, the, the initial assignment here uh, is case number one. You have these assignments here. And then the control loop here is uh, our cases two and three that are executed um, uh, one, one after the other um, uh, all the time. And so you see that the structure of the, how the program is built has been totally changed from something like this into something like that. And that's actually the idea of control flow, graph, uh, control flow flattening. Um, in terms of uh, products, there's a lot of uh, commercial products out there. Uh, and of course, these products are language dependent, meaning that for Java, you will need a different obfuscator than for .NET and for JavaScript for different languages. Uh, I, we've listed just some of the most, uh, most uh, well-known ones, uh, but there's a lot of commercial and um, um, uh, open source uh, obfuscators around there. Uh, one of the interesting ones definitely is also ProGuard, which is uh, um, an, uh, an open source one. It's actually built by uh, a person not li not li uh, here living here in the neighborhood. Um, and actually, I've seen that used quite a lot in, in banking environments, for instance. So it's not always necessary. It's, it's a quite an a quite a impressive obfuscator piece of software. And actually, it's been used a lot in, in, commercial, in commercial situations. Um, uh, there definitely is performance impact. If you would look at um, this, for instance, um, the, 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 you will see that uh, if you would look of, on how they do it, you would see that um, one iteration of uh, the loop here is actually, in this case, an iteration in case two and an iteration in case three. So it's actually different iterations that you have to do for one iteration in the, in the, in the previous one. So there definitely is, is performance impact. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, okay. And then uh, some final uh, thoughts on obfuscation. Um, as I said before, obfuscation makes it harder to analyze the software, it doesn't make it impossible. So you can still, if you spend enough time, you can still figure out what the software is actually doing. Um, yeah, of course, it's, it has to be semantic preserving, meaning that when you apply uh, obfuscation, the exact execution of the software has to be the same. The output, the semantics of the software have to, have to be the same. Um, on the negative side, obfuscation is sometimes used to hide malicious code. Some attackers are actually using obfuscation to, when they insert malicious code in a piece of software, to hide that. Uh, and that you will also see that sometimes in practice, antivirus products are actually triggered by obfuscation techniques. And they will block um, software that's being uh, obfuscated and will just uh, mark it as, uh, as suspicious or as uh, uh, blocked. Um, code obfuscation techniques as well, as you will see with a number of these other controls, can actually also be applied in combination with other, with other techniques. So for instance, in this case, um, a product key can be, can be um, uh, some product key can be used to derive a secret key that can, that can be, then be used to deobfuscate some, some part of the code uh, that, that might be uh, uh, using a key to, de to obfuscate or deobfuscate. So in that sense, uh, combining a number of these controls can make it more difficult for, uh, for the attacker to, to break through the control. Okay, any questions on obfuscation? Was that clear? Yeah, okay, let's move to the next one. That would be, yeah, so the yeah. I guess that's, yeah. We're going to skip a few anti-debugging and we'll do white box cryptography. Um, just out of curiosity, does it make, does that ring a bell for anyone? Does anyone understand what white box might mean or come across it? How do I leave it? Um, uh, white box cryptography has probably the advantage here of being one of the only techniques that aims to actually operate in the model that we're considering, which is this malicious host model, where the idea being that um, an attacker has full access to your platform, can inspect anything, can analyze anything, um, and can tamper. Um, so when you're encrypting something, the, the secret source is always the key, um, and you go through hoops to try and hide the key so that the attacker can't extract it. The idea being that once they have the key, game over. They've uh, managed to, uh, they can decrypt anything. Um, White Box aims to keep the key in plain sight. You're not hiding it but you're embedding it in the cipher and mangling it in such a way that you actually can't distinguish the cipher from the key. You're mixing code and data. So the attacker can analyze it all they like. Um, they won't get any information on the actual key in a way that they can use it. Um, 
we'll skip on. That's what I mentioned earlier on, that uh, it's operating in a white box model. So um, it, was, it was developed somewhere around 2000, 2002, I think. Um, uh, and it derives its name also from the, the model that it's operating in. So in cryptography, you have, you've probably heard from Bart Pranil, those who've been attending some of the ones, that you have all sorts of indistinguishability and various things that, uh, that, that uh, um, are defined so that we can properly analyze crypto. And um, here they wanted to analyze, they wanted to, to, to define a, an attacker model so that they could properly um, define how you might go about protecting it. Um, and so they defined this white box uh, model and then cryptography that solved it was the white box cryptography. In a sense, the uh, implementation has to be its own protection because the implementation is open to scrutiny. Um, graphically, what it might look like, um, on the left you've got your cipher text um, and uh, you've got, sorry, your cipher um, where, and then you've got a key. You take the key, you somehow embed it into the cipher uh, and what gets, if you think about it naively, um, think of AES or any crypto implementation you'd like, um, what you could do is say, I will have, instead of writing the algorithm that does the encryption or decryption, I'm now actually going to say, for a given input, this is the output. For this input, this is the output. And I'll exhaustively list all inputs and then the mapping of all outputs. And you could encode that as lookup tables. If this is the input, this will be the output. Obviously, that's not realistic for an algorithm that encodes, that encrypts anything. But then also, if you look at um, how algorithms are normally written, um, they do have this concept of S boxes, T boxes, various boxes within the encryption algorithm. Um, those have far more narrowly defined inputs and outputs. Box that takes four bits input, four bits output. I will then go and list every possible input and every possible output given a particular key. So that's essentially what happens. Your, your whole algorithm ends up being mapped out in terms of all the inputs, all the outputs. And in doing so, you're now scrambling the code that would have done the encryption or decryption and the key that would have determined which box was chosen, in what order, how they were permutated. Um, and so you end up with that kind of mess where actually Encryption just means you feed in plain text and out comes ciphertext. You don't need to put a key. The key is already baked in. And decryption is the opposite. You just feed in uh, ciphertext and out will come the plain text. Um, a bit more of how it works is a very mathematical thing. Uh, it's quite telling. Most of the techniques we have here, you can look at them at two levels. You can look at the academic research, and there'll be lots of publications. You can see the commercial products. You can also go and look at the hacker culture. Um, uh, I mean it in a good way, possibly a bad way. FRAC is a very interesting long history magazine um, where a lot of um, hacker cracker techniques are explained in excruciating detail, but practically minded. You have code, you know how it's done. There's one article in FRAC from a couple of years ago, the, late, the last issue I think, uh, that tries to look at white box and tries to look at a, a naive challenge that was uh, posed at um, hack.lu, which is one of the yeah, Belgium Luxembourg um, hacking conferences. Um, but the reason being, it's, it's pretty mathematical, it's pretty dense, it's pretty tough. Um, COSIC, uh, so again, Professor Pranil's group uh, has, uh, is one of the top groups where they do address this. A few years ago, there was a PhD on uh, designing white box crypto schemes, and this last year, there was another one on breaking them. So if you really want details on how the mathematics work, uh, those two are good ones to look at, um, and they'll give you a good idea of state of the art for the designing and for breaking. Um, but essentially what you're doing is you take, uh, the, um, you take the key, the key gets merged with the cipher. You can then, the advantage of it is you can then apply various randomizations, encodings before you do, um, before you merge the key and then you can undo them. So this is the, uh, this concept of bijective encodings where you can modify it somehow, undo the modifications. The advantage that has is that the same cipher with the same key, you can actually produce multiple white box implementations that look completely different uh, because you've added this degree of randomness. So you can distribute now the same key to multiple customers. The binary that they have that includes this key will look completely different. And so someone trying to analyze them, it's, it's again harder is the idea to, to, to extract the key if you can extract it because you've extracted it with all these randomizations, it will not apply um, necessarily to another implementation. Um, 
Another reason that you might do it, so I have here so another final step, yet another thing that you might do, is um, this concept of independent encodings that have nothing to do with the key or the cipher. You might want to apply these because one of the attacks against white box is what we call code lifting, where you just take a chunk of the code, cut it out of the binary, and paste it in there. So assuming I have an encryption, I might want to just, for a symmetric cipher, I might want to take that routine out, paste it into a file somewhere, if I feed it ciphertext, it should decrypt. Um, same thing with key ver license verification um, code. If I can find the code that verifies whether a license is correct, presumably I can, depending on the algorithm, but in general, you can then use that to generate valid licenses. Or you could use it as a, if I want to do a brute force crack of valid licenses, I could take the license checking bit, put it in a separate binary, and I just feed it a license, and it says yes, no as the result of the function. So you've, you've taken the code out and used it. This thing, um, these independent encodings, uh, prevent that. The idea is you can apply these encodings before the encryption, and they'll actually get removed before the, sorry, uh, yeah, before the, and they'll get removed before the decryption. So that prevents you from taking, the taking a white box implementation out and reusing it um, for decryption as opposed to encryption if uh, that's how it was designed. Advantages? Um, well, there are quite a few disadvantages, so it's, it's good that there are advantages. Um, it aims, obviously, to do away with the hardware component. It's trying to operate in a completely open uh, model. And so we know you can't trust anything running on your PC. It will be broken. Um, so the only way to really provide secure crypto would be to have a hardware dongle where the key is in hardware. And even then, those get attacked um, quite a lot. Side channel analysis is a, a, a big topic these days with hardware. Um, so this gives you, you remove the hardware portion. So you have faster manufacturing, it's cheaper, you no longer have to produce hardware. Um, and in principle, assuming there are no bugs, etc., you don't depend on the hardware working correctly with, especially in embedded and low level things where you've got a crypto chip that may actually not work um, as advertised on all platforms. Um, a few other interesting ones. Uh, this concept of natural diversification. So I was saying by applying these encodings, you can have the same key because fundamentally white box up until now is taking a fixed key, merging it with a cipher. Um, so it doesn't have the flexibility of being able to encrypt with multiple keys. Your white box implementation is tied to one key. Um, I'll come back to that. Turns out that's not necessarily true. That's how it's done securely. Um, current research is trying to have dynamic keys um, Apple has a patent that they've been awarded for dynamic keys um, in white box implementations. It does, as far as we know, uh, as far as published academic research says, it does lower the security of the resulting implementation. Um, the other advantage being that um, depending on how you apply the encodings, you can take a symmetric cipher, which normally encryption is the same as decryption with the same key. And if you only provide an API to encrypt, um, it can't be used to decrypt. So you can turn a symmetric cipher into an asymmetric cipher via a, a hack of sorts. Uh, disadvantages, uh, as I said, the naive implementation where you're taking um, your whole cipher and mapping all the inputs to all possible outputs, if you just think of how big that lookup table is going to be, um, well, this is essentially white box suffers from that to a certain extent. You can end up with um, 188 times the size. There are different implementations. Depending on how many of these encodings you apply, it's a trade-off between trying to hide the key and bake it more fully into the algorithm. And to do that, you apply more, more transformations, more um, encodings. That makes the resulting um, binary larger. Uh, obviously, slowdown. We're talking somewhere around 55 times slowdown, again, depending. Uh, on PCs, that's not such a bad thing, but turns out uh, white boxes used quite a lot in DRM in things like set-top boxes, which again, I suppose now I'm, are going towards um, becoming more powerful PCs, so uh, okay. But in more embedded things, uh, these are pretty prohibitive, code size and runtime run uh, overhead. Um, the other problem is that they're still, they're the most secure thing we probably have, or the more complicated thing to break in terms of being founded on strong mathematics, but the problem is the attacker model is so so powerful, an attacker can do absolutely anything. So in practice, pretty much all, and this shouldn't, so oops, that shouldn't say yes, sorry, that should actually say all white box. Um, 
I'll touch on that. AES and DES are the two main ones, and then there are some elliptic curve, but these are the main ciphers. All academic published ones have been broken. Um, the only reason probably commercial ones haven't been broken is that they're not published. It doesn't mean that they're actually any better than academic ones necessarily. We obviously don't know since uh, they don't get published. But, um, but they're broken also by academics. Uh, we're talking PhD in crypto with years of experience. So depending on what, who, what your attacker model and who your attacker is, if that's a viable attacker, then white box may not solve uh, your problem. Uh, it's used by yeah quite a few, um, and there are also quite a few companies that provide solutions in terms of they'll give you a crypto library. So if you're using, I know OpenSSL as a library to do your crypto, um, you'd actually replace that as a drop-in. So instead of calling uh, your routines to set up the key to encrypt, etc., they'll replace those with routines that do white box encryption, white box decryption, white box signature verification, white box, etc. Um, there are quite a few, um, and if you were paying attention to bots, where you, he mentioned earlier on that uh, some of these companies that did obfuscation, Arxon was one of the ones. You'll start seeing that these companies tend to come back. Um, Irdeto, a cloakware, was also a big one for obfuscation. Um, and you'll note that they actually provide most of these transformations and most of these controls uh, as part of their offerings. Um, white box is, well, sorry, white encryption is quite an impressive one. Probably has the widest range of, uh, of, of ciphers that they provide. They cover uh, symmetric, asymmetric. Um, they do this with, so for them it's interesting, they actually have a FIPS 140 certified device. Uh, they call this this secure key box. Um, I'm not promoting them <laughs> in this sense, I should say, I suppose, uh, but they are interesting in the fact that they, in, in the sense that they provide more implementations and in the sense that they have a FIPS 140 certified um, device. So if that's, when I say device, it's actually software. Huh? Um, this is all done in software. Another interesting aspect that they have, um, and we'll come back to diversification later on, is that um, you can ask for the multiple instances of this SKB, the secure key box, which is a library essentially for doing white box transformations. You can ask for, say, 10 of them that have the same key, but internally look completely different. They've been diversified with these different encodings. And so then you can ship these things if you wanted to different places um, and gives you added robustness, I guess, in a sense, uh, as an extra layer. But that's one interesting example of where diversification is almost used for the sake of diversification. Um, yeah, when you're writing slides at some point you want to read XKCD, so you have to insert one. It turns out that um, mostly what we observe is that attackers don't go after the white box crypto. It raises the bar sufficiently that there's always a weaker link around it. Uh, you'll find some other way of breaking it. The white box will normally not be your weakest link. So if you can tolerate the size increase, the overhead of execution, it will protect your key. Uh, then the question is, how is it used elsewhere? What other things um, can be attacked? I think that's out for the white box, and Bart will yep. carry on. Okay. Time is it. Um, going to um, unauthorized uh, modification. So trying, attackers trying to modify your software by including some malicious code or, or whatever. Uh, two techniques uh, that we want to discuss here. One is code signing, but maybe depending on uh, your knowledge of code signing, I don't know, who is, who is familiar with code signing? Not all of you? Who is not familiar with code signing? Okay, I'll briefly uh, explain it and what it does, and then we, then we move on. Okay, what is, the, what is the idea of code signing? It's actually that you're kind of uh, uh, stamping the content of a piece of code and making sure that whenever you change the content you can verify that the stamp is no longer correct. That's the idea of code signing. Um, you have different ways of doing code signing. The most uh, practical way uh, is using public-private uh, uh, key uh, uh, cryptography uh, because they have uh, pr uh, um, uh, uh, algorithms in there that actually provide you these kind of signing, signing mechanisms. So what you do is uh, you take a piece of software, uh, you compute some um, fingerprint of the software typically using a hash function, and that hash function is being signed by uh, a private key, um, a private key of public-private key pair. And this is actually uh, the, uh, right there. yeah, you're signing the hash function, 
Uh, you're signing the output of the hash function and you're adding that to the original code. And so the, the, the result of that is you have original code and you have a signed version of the hash function and that together provides you the code signing. So once you change, if you would change the original code, the, 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 the signed hash that you would have uh, would not match anymore with, the, uh, with the, the code that is in there and by doing that you can verify whether the code has been changed or not. Is that clear? Maybe Bartonel also discussed it during the cryptography uh, uh, sessions, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, clear. Um, it has been used uh, quite a lot. Um, for instance, uh, Java and .NET uh, execution platforms do, do use it and they actually assign different properties on signed versus unsigned code. But actually, in my opinion, the real um, explosion of, of uh, code signing has been, uh, has been done uh, with, uh, with mobile uh, applications in the sense that they, have all, they all have these app stores where you can download software and if you look at those app stores and the software on them, on the mobile apps, they're all signed. And they're all signed for a reason. For instance, uh, Apple, if you download a signed app, actually there's some processing behind that. Uh, Apple does not just uh, publish an app on an app store. What it does, it typically first always verifies the app on the app store. It does some verification on that. It's really not clear what they actually do in practice, but they do a few verification steps on that, on that software. And then once that's done, they sign a piece of the app to make sure that whenever down, someone downloads it, uh, it's, they know that it has been verified by Apple. So for most of the mobile platforms, all the apps are signed uh, when you download them. That's a very important uh, application of code signing. Uh, yeah, I think uh, anything uh, important here? Yeah, of course, um, in, in signing, that's, it, it goes without saying, but of course if you're signing software, whenever you're using software, you have to make sure that you verify the signature. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Eh? So you always have a component that is signing the software, taking the source, putting a signature on that, and whenever you're executing the software, it's a component that's verifying the signature, whether the signature is correct. It relies on PKI, on public key infrastructure uh, technology. Uh, so of course, uh, if they are trustworthy, also the code signing can be trusted to some extent. If you're using the correct um, ciphers, you're using correct, uh, good hash functions and these kind of things. So there's a lot of crypto behind that as well. But uh, once you can trust the PKI and you're using the correct uh, algorithms, PK, uh, 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 cryptographic algorithms, um, these, can be, uh, these can be trusted to, to, to ensure the, the, the piece of software is not, is not tampered with. Um, that was code, uh, code signing in a nutshell, because I think most of you are aware with it, uh, are, are familiar with it. Um, let's move on to the yes, next yeah. one, which is the code cards. Sorry? Code cards, I guess. Um, wait there. Uh. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm going to so give you that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. The code okay. cards we'll also do things uh, yeah. relatively quickly. Code cards, um, uh, it's a, essentially, it's an integrity mechanism. Small bits of code that are embedded in your program that will try and check the validity at runtime of parts of your program. You can think of a naive example again of being um, a bit of code at some point that gets executed that checks a sensitive variable that it might want to be a certain value. And so it might check it. Is, is it still this value? Okay, it still is. Um, the idea being to prevent people from tampering. Um, if somebody modifies that value, the code guard knows what the value should be, or it might know what the checksum a hash should be. Um, it'll then transfer control and exit. You want to hide them, you want to prevent the attacker from modifying them. So you might have code guards that check each other. You'll generally, what you'll do is to hide them, you'll embed lots of these throughout the code. Um, so something like that. If you think of G as being your guards, they'll be embedded throughout your control flow. Uh, they'll be checking on each other. Um, and you have, generally I said, it's an integrity mechanism. You can also have it being a form of self-healing. So you might have some of these guards that know what a particular value should be or know what an instruction should be. Now you get into a self-modifying code, which might not work on some, doesn't normally work on, on architectures now because we have a non-executable stack, um, et cetera. But so for data values, this, this, this would work. Um, if the value's changed, it might overwrite it again with the backup value that it had. Um, it's, 
I think I've mentioned most of these things. Uh, you want to hide it. You want to hide these guards to stop people from finding them and cancelling them out. Um, generally, you also have a whole intricate network of them checking on each other so that when one's, ca one's cancelled, it's caught somewhere else and uh, your program still misbehaves. Um, and then it was first, again, this Arxon that comes back, another company that we've mentioned before. Um, they it was pioneered at Purdue University, another academic thing, and Zarkson was a spin-off, uh, which now sells security uh, solutions, one of them being, or integrating code guards. Um, Microsoft has used it in uh, protection in depth, so there's something called CFI normally, control flow integrity. The idea is you know how, what the control flow of a program is, you try and enforce that. If you're trying to abuse the program, normally you're trying to um, make insert new control flows that weren't there before. Um, what they do is they use code guards in here to try and detect uh, valid transfers of control, valid uh, flows, uh, val valid values that they've got on stacks. Think of if any of you are familiar with um, some of the older um, overflow protections, so canary values that are placed on the stack and then checked before functions return to prevent stack frame corruption. Uh, about the, the same thing here, they, they check for various values. Um, same thing again, they, you're adding more stuff into your code, it becomes bigger, it becomes slower. Um, the guards can be brittle because you want to place them at certain places. Uh, the compiler might optimize these guards and move them around or remove them, rewrite them and actually break their functionality. So a lot of the time guards are actually done, you're using binary rewriting after the compilers um, compiled your code. Unless of course you've got a code guard aware compiler, which generally doesn't exist. Um, even for example, the Microsoft solution where you could implement it, but the Microsoft solution where they have full control over the whole software stack, they do it using binary rewriting on ex existing executables. Um, that was that in a nutshell. Uh, am I still on for the next one? Yep, watermarking. Watermarking. Yip, 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 yip. So proof carrying code's an interesting one, but uh, no commercial applicability for now. Uh, watermarking. Now we're moving on to, this doesn't protect people from cracking your software anyway. What it does do is it tries to give you an idea of um, who leaked the software assuming you can identify the software or you tie it to somebody. Um, they call it traitor tracing, also another name for it. Um, now, it's no, we're probably more familiar with it in a media context. So you get uh, cracked, um, pirated films, things like that, where the, you might see a watermark saying this is the property of so-and-so studios. Um, you might uh, not see anything at all, but then it's in, normally um, you'll try and hide it. So this is the canonical, um, Lena, this is actually uh, any watermarking paper you see will always include her. And then a few years ago, some female academics decided to get their revenge and they did the same, a paper on watermarking, but included those who are old enough to remember Fabio, an Italian, I don't know, a model, what he actually is, but they included Fabio instead of Lena because of, uh, um, so uh, this is a canonical one. So what happens normally is you'll try and hide this watermark by changing certain pixels, for example. Um, so the tenth pixel will have, will be off slightly, and then you'll do that for a certain number of pixels, and that encodes the owner, or the, 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 it might encode copyright information, but it might also encode who this media was initially given to. Um, so if this is leaked, you then have software, of course, that can go through, extract the, reconstruct the information based on X number of pixels, whatever scheme they use, they're normally secret, um, and then derive the initial license holder's name and presumably hold them liable for having leaked um, the media. Uh, in software, slightly different, that's the same idea. Um, I think I've mentioned more or less that it can be perceptible or imperceptible, so hidden or not. Um, it only really makes sense if you're not making it generic. So if you're including uniquely identifying information. If I buy a copy of IDA Pro or something, um, the license should uniquely identify me so that when I leak it on the internet, they can track it down and say, this is a license, this came from you, how come it's on the internet? Um, the watermarking is embedding this thing. Now what you want to do is you also want to actually extract it at some point. So fingerprinting related is a concept of extracting some property of media or here software is what we're interested in um, that can uniquely identify it. 
It doesn't have to be a watermark. So when we were talking earlier on about um, white box crypto and these diversifying transformations, those diversifying transformations might uniquely identify the, um, the white box. So you don't actually need anything else. You can extract that and that is your watermark. Um, however, uh, normally the fingerprinting will be extracting some form of identifying watermark. Uh, they can be done statically, so I can think of a naive example again of just having a variable in, my, in the program that says assigned to or licensee and put the, the name in there. A bit obvious, you probably want to hide it a bit more. You might hide it in the code um, by, for example, a certain ordering of blocks of code will be translated to, but then you want to avoid that transformations break it. So if it's an ordering of blocks of code, I can imagine that somebody might, with binary writing, reorder these blocks of code. That breaks uh, your watermarking scheme. Uh, the other way of doing it is dynamically, where it's not hidden statically in the binary, but it's actually built at runtime. So in games, we come across this with this concept of Easter eggs, where depending on if you bang against a wall, jump up three or four times, something strange happens. Um, so for non-obvious input, something happens. Um, so watermarks will generally be non-obvious inputs that are somehow encoded into the program. And one interesting one that I'll come to is this concept of data structures. You might have a data structure inside the program that is built based on input that you give it. Um, and then you can recognize this data structure once you've run the program by profiling the heap. So heap analysis is an established technique where you can see what the shape of a program's heap is like, i.e. fingerprinting the dynamic data structures that are in there. Um, I'll skip through this, I'll just talk briefly. Um, a watermarking scheme, for example, you take um, a number. I might want to assign your, your finger, your, the watermark I assign you is number 31. So I want to combine, convert 31 somehow into a data structure that when I give it a certain, when I give the program a certain input, I will recognize this data structure, which is a representation of 31 in memory. Um, and the way they do it, well, one, one overview, um, this is this, uh, Kohlberg is a big name in obfuscation throughout most of the things we do, um, is he'll convert the 31 into some permutation that then gets mapped into a graph. This gives you a notion of the graph and then the, the actual Thing, watermarking scheme is code embedded into the software that builds this graph at runtime. Um, and so at runtime, when you feed it a certain input, you'll end up with this code, this, this graph that's been allocated and built on the heap. And so um, somebody finds, or the, the, the original property ho license holder finds the software online, they download it, they feed it the input, this gives you a vague notion of how it's done. Uh, a linked list where you say the first element in the list in um, maps to this element here. So then the first digit is actually nine. The second element in the list points at six. So the second digit is six, nine, six, et cetera. Um, and that's how you extract the uh, watermark. Um, I'll skip this. This is media. Google's content ID is a, a well-known example. Um, normally, not, not used as much as you'd imagine, I think. Um, a lot of it is also trying to, you try and tie software to the host it's executing on. Uh, that gets done more. Um, and that's something that we'll cover, I think, also in a bit. <sighs> Sorry, s ask whenever. We'll get a little quickly uh, to get through some of them. But um, stop now or stop afterwards and ask any details you'd like. I'm happy to elaborate more. How are you doing? Okay, still following? Okay, perfect. Speed okay? Yeah? Okay, let's move on to the next. Um, DRM, uh, you're probably familiar with the term uh, digital rights management. So what they uh, are trying to do there is to make sure that um, data or software that's being shipped to a particular user cannot easily be uh, copied to other users. And the prime example of DRM is music protection, for instance. When you download uh, a music file from, uh, from iTunes, actually the, the, the file that you download is actually protected and you cannot easily copy it to another device and play it on another device. Uh, another device of another person, let's put it that way. You cannot copy it to another person that, that, uh, that will be able to play the file. Um, how do they do that typically? Uh, either uh, by including some piece of information in the media or in the software. Um, 
including tags uh, using encryption to make sure that you cannot just play or view or execute the application or they also sometimes uh, use uh, licensing schemes to do that and in that sense DRM is more like a, a concept either rather than a practical a very practical implementation of something so the digital rights management is more like a concept and they use different techniques to actually implement it um, so what you will, in this case, it would be, it's an example of a piece of uh, a, a music file. So you, you, you would have uh, an, 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 a user that's trying to download, it's trying to execute a particular, or play a particular file, a music file, everything is everything. I don't know what, uh, what artist that is. Um, somehow you would have that file, uh, with that file linked, uh, the different uh, rights that the user has on that file. So you could, for instance, play the file or copy the file, download the file, and there might be some obligations or restrictions based on that. So that's kind of the kind of uh, uh, rights that they want to impose on the file once the file is being downloaded at the client side. That's the idea behind DRM. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to discuss briefly two examples. Uh, Fairplay uh, is the Apple example I just gave earlier. So uh, the, actually the two examples are two, two examples of data. Uh, or, or uh, files, uh, music files. You, can al you could also apply the scheme to software protection, but in, in practice we see mostly uh, the scheme has been used for data protection rather than software protection. Yeah. Just for your information, I, uh, Apple dropped DRM encryption in 2005. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no longer using that. Uh, okay. Uh, good information. <laughs> Thanks for that. Anyway, what was being done? Actually, the, the problem with DRM is it's uh, not only a technical problem, it's also a political problem. So there's a lot of resistance against DRM schemes. Um, and so um, companies are not always wanting to, to implement those schemes because of that, because of that resistance of, of users. Now, what was being, uh, being used? What was being used then is that you, so you have an, an audio stream uh, encoded in a particular format. Uh, and what was being on, done is actually that the audio stream is uh, encrypted by some key uh, to encrypt that audio stream and that key itself was encrypted by user key. So the key that to protect the, the, uh, the audio file was actually again encrypted by user specific key. And so whenever you wanted to play uh, that particular file, uh, you, you need to have the user key which could then be used to decrypt the, uh, the, 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 the master key of the file and then you could decrypt the, the actual content of the data and play the file. Uh, it was used in two ways, uh, in an online and offline mode. Uh, in an online mode actually you, could, you would uh, contact uh, Apple itself for the, for the keys to make sure that you have the keys. In an offline mode there was a way in which the keys were actually be stored in your devices. So for instance uh, for an iPod there was an encrypted key storage where the keys would be stored that you could then be, uh, use uh, to, to decrypt the files, to, to decrypt the master key to decrypt the files. Uh, a second example is uh, Netflix, uh, that's a bit more, uh, a bit more recent. Um, Netflix is using uh, an, an, uh, a recent specification by the, the W3C consortium being uh, encrypted media extension. Um, and what, that, what it actually is, it, it provides like a, an, a model and an API to protect the, uh, the, 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 the viewing of, uh, of, uh, of videos in this case um, with some model. And they, they base that on um, the MPEG, MPEG stream and they actually add some, some, uh, some uh, additions in the MPEG stream to do that. Um, let me, um, yeah, so I said before it's an API, it's not a solution. So there's different implementations of that and so Netflix is actually doing the, one of these implementations. So, and when you're uh, using Netflix, there's some pieces of software that you have to download and install in your machine to make this DRM system work. Um, it has a number of operations. The, the um, EME uh, specification has a number of operations. One of the, the, the typical operations clearly is to decrypt a, a particular uh, video stream. So you ask a component in the EME model to, uh, when, whenever you have an encrypted video stream, to decrypt that stream. And that's one of the, the, the clear operations that's in there. But also it supports more um, um, yeah, license exchanges between you and, for instance, Netflix, the, the, the content provider that's actually providing you with the videos. And so there, the example that I gave earlier, the graphical scheme where you have you can use it, but you have to pay like one dollar per use, and you can only use it in these kind of scenarios. That's also Im embedded in this in this in this model. 
So very, very briefly, I'm not going to go into mu too much detail, but what, what happens with the EME specification is you have your content distribution network, so where all the videos is coming are coming from. It goes to your browser, to your local browser, and it sees that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's protected content. So what it does, it will ask, uh, it will ask the key to, uh, to decrypt that media to the, the content provider, to actually the party that's linked to that content provider. So of course, in reality, this is typically uh, separated from um, this part. This is really the distribution network where you would get the video streams. And this is the, the part where the actual streams are protected and where all the key related uh, exchanges happen with, with Netflix in this case. So you would ask for a key somehow uh, to Netflix. That key would be uh, sent back to your, uh, if, if you have access to your uh, system. There, there are in your browser, there is actually a media session being created to play that file actually. And that media session is linked to the key that you get to play that video stream. Uh, and what then happens is using that key that's being stored in the browser, you actually uh, access uh, a content decryption module, which is a piece of software that you actually download from, from Netflix. It's actually embedded typically in your browser. It's a piece of uh, an, 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 an add-on to your browser. And that content decryption model is actually um, um, responsible for dec decrypting video streams. And once those video streams are decrypted, they're sent back to the browser and they're shown, then they're shown on the screen. In case of Netflix, it's a software module. Clearly, of course, also the underlying platform could be used uh, by the software model to do the encryption, in the, uh, to the decryption in this case of, the, of these video streams. So that's how this EME uh, model is working. Um, <coughs> Um, DRM, as it is a software-only protection technique, again, also here, uh, it's not fully resistant to bypass. Uh, these, these schemes have been bypassed. Some of these schemes have been bypassed in the past. Um, it's it's uh, currently being used as an enforcement technique, but also as a, as a legal tool to try to, to, to make people yeah, stop uh, yeah, yeah, playing, playing illegal, illegal content. Um, DRM as a concept. A general concept is technology independent, but of course, once you start uh, implementing DRM uh, solutions on particular targets, being it audio or video or whatever, it becomes highly technology dependent. That's clear. Okay, that was it. Uh, what uh, for for DRM? Then and diversity, and then if you want to diversification. No, no, I think. Twenty uh, plus other two. Yeah, yeah, four minutes. Okay. Okay, we'll skip quickly to um, because. It's interesting. Diversification. Um, I mentioned earlier on, for example, with white box, it gives you natural diversification by having these encodings. Um, the idea is you're trying to, now we have this problem of a monoculture with software. We have your copy of Word is exactly the same as anybody else's copy of Word, more or less given the same version. Um, and same thing with a, a lot of, which is why when someone a cracker cracks uh, software, they can generally construct a patch, release the patch, You'll, you won't download the fully cracked software, you'll just download the patch and apply it to your thing and that then cracks the licensing scheme. That happens a lot. If internally all this software was different, for example, that wouldn't work anymore. You'd have to crack every instance um, itself. Um, another issue we have, um, I think we'll do, uh, this is what we, we'd be aiming towards. We'd be aiming towards a single source code, you compile it. Um, you might put in a seed or something that tells the compiler, this is a special compiler, a diversifying compiler, um, and it will output lots of different binaries. They're all functionally the same, semantically the same, they do exactly the same thing. Internally, they're laid out differently. They're diversified. Um, there are a number of techniques that you can use. I think Bart mentioned earlier on the control flow flattening as an obfuscation technique. It also happens to be a diversification technique. They're, they're all intimately linked. You start to get the feel now that uh, uh, a lot of these are the same. Um, I mentioned also earlier on uh, using reordering basic blocks in a program, for example, might break the watermark that's inserted. Um, reordering basic blocks is also a diversification technique, etc. cetera. Um, there is this concept. Yeah, we'll skip this uh, for now. Uh, there are quite a few. I was ex this was mostly giving an idea of what some of these uh, diversification schemes might look like. A simple one might be, for example, you have if a certain condition, do something else, do something else. If this certain condition is always true, then you'll always do the true bit, and this will never get run, dead code. So you could embed pretty much anything you wanted in there, knowing that it would never get run. It won't change the, the, the program, but internally it'll look different. Um, so you end up with things like this, for example, if 
this condition, which it turns out P and Q are primes. Uh, uh, M and N are non-zero, so it can never be zero. So this is always evaluate to false. But uh, you can end up with some complex ones, and it gives you some space to embed um, diversification things. An interesting application, and this was done uh, here at Ghent. Uh, Ghent University does a lot with diversification. Uh, what happens normally, Microsoft releases their patches on their patch Tuesday. Uh, hackers get to work, uh, work all of Tuesday, and by Wednesday morning, you figured out what was being patched. You've developed an exploit for it. Qu quite frequently, this happens. It might take a bit longer, but it can be pretty quick. Um, and so now you've got all these exploits that are ready for exploit Wednesday, and you have banks, various institutions that are quite cautious about patching and will not patch straight away. You might, it'll have to go through testing, etc. So now all of a sudden you've got exploits in the wild for something that was patched yesterday, but in practice will not be deployed for probably a few months to come. Um, this is possible because it turns out, so there are quite a few different um, binary diffing tools that let you take one program, uh, or the two instances of program, the pre-patched and the post-patch, um, and diff them, and they'll say, this is the code that changed. So presumably, this is where the security fix is. Bin diff is one of the more popular ones. Um, it's actually an IDA Pro plugin, so you need IDA Pro for it. Um, but what would happen if Microsoft didn't just release the patch as it was, but actually created the patch and then transformed this patch multiple times by adding all sorts of other stuff that didn't fix just the security vulnerability, but just did other things that might, that wouldn't affect the functionality of the program. But what it would mean is that when you then take the new version of, of the, the, the security fixed version, the vulnerable version and diff them, bin diff now gives you, instead of just saying these 10 lines, which is where the security fix is, it gives you 80, 90% of the code, and this is all changed. Um, you still have to now go through all the code to find the actual security fix, which then tells you what the security vulnerability is. It just takes a lot longer. The advantage of these binary diffing tools is that they really reduce the search space that an attacker has to go through to identify what's fixed in a patch. Um, so Ghent University, for example, set, um, set themselves a task of taking some um, security patched software, pre-patched, and actually using diversification so they'd run bin diff on the patched and pre-patched version, and bin diff would say, these are the things that have changed. So then they'd say, okay, so bin diff detected that these changed by, for example, maybe the functions themselves, functions that you don't touch will never change. So you can just hash the function in the patched version and hash the function in the pre-patched version. If they have the same hash, the instructions haven't changed, so you exclude it. So if bin diff says that, then you say, okay, right, well, let me, if I order basic blocks in a function, the hash will change. So you'll, you'll apply that. And then Binif will say, oh, this function's changed. Um, but then it's got other heuristics that will say, actually, the instructions cumulatively haven't changed and the control flow hasn't changed. So even though the hash doesn't match, they're still the same. So you say, OK, well, I'll apply control flow flattening. Now the control flow no longer matches. The hash is not. And you keep doing these things iteratively until you break all of, for example, Binif here. Um, uh, as heuristics. And then Binif says, oh, these two functions have changed. So the output of running um, so they have these, trans these diversification transforms that they run. But the output of all of this is that now you take the patched version, the pre-patched version, you diff them, whereas beforehand, bin diff manages to remove something like 98% of all code. So it leaves you with 2% of the code that has changed. They managed to drop that to um, 2 to 6% of the code looks like it's still the same. 96% has changed. Um, they do this by running something like 18 iterations, diversifying iterations they found was about the optimal. Um, this is explaining what I've just said, essentially. Um, the code overhead side, you're diversifying, so you're obviously adding things to make it look bigger. The patch is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so you end up with a code overhead of something like 30 to 40%, an execution slowdown. They also, when you're diversifying, you can choose to diversify mostly cold code that doesn't get run, obviously, frequently. Um, as you fail to change things, you might start diversifying hotter and hotter code, knowing that you're, in, you're incurring a penalty. But if you're, if you're optimizing for large bin diff output, um, sometimes you sacrifice that. Uh, but so it turns out after 18 iterations, bin diff couldn't tell what had changed. And the idea for this would be to, well, let's do that. Microsoft releases a patch, diversify it. It takes now, you can't reverse it in the day. It takes you maybe a week. For a week, those who've applied the patches will have a slowdown. But then at the end of the week, Microsoft says, OK, now 
we don't mind, enough people have patched, we'll release a second patch, which is essentially the undiversified patch. And now um, everyone is running an optimized version again. Crackers can still, hackers can still diff the patches, find what the security vulnerabilities, but you've bought yourself a week of time. Um, that's the idea behind it, and that's something that diversification, for example, could do. There are many applications, but that's one. Okay, so I think we're coming uh, to an end. A few more minutes left, so I'm gonna skip the logging, uh, the secure logging part, and uh, gonna go to oh, some. Sorry. Did you want me to do the first few? Yes. So no, I'll, I'll just. Uh, sure? Yeah, I don't know. Um, um, some final thoughts. Um, one thing that we um, see uh, definitely is that um, the software protection, the software only schemes are, um, are, are limited in protection. We've discussed that. If you don't control the platform below, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to actually uh, provide any assurance on, on, on your actual software that, that's running there. So one, one of the things that we do see is, uh, and I'm trying to figure out where this, yeah, for instance, uh, is, is the fact that um, they're bringing the software protection techniques more and more towards the hardware layer. And they're including, they're basing themselves on, on TPMs and other uh, techniques on the processor level itself to make sure that um, you cannot change or run the code uh, if, if, you don't, if you don't have the, the, the necessary rights. One of the things, for instance, is one of the te techniques that we didn't discuss is uh, code encryption, in which you actually encrypt the code and you decrypt the code just before running it. Now, if you de de decrypt the code in software, you still have the decrypted code in your memory somewhere, and you, you will be able to access that. Now, they're looking more and more into schemes where you actually can decrypt the code actually at the processor level. So you're sending the encrypted code to the processor, the processor will decrypt it and running when, uh, uh, execute it when, when, it's, when it's decrypted. And th it, by doing that, you won't have any encrypted, uh, decrypted code in your memory again, and you won't have access to, the, to that system. So we see definitely a trend towards making use more and more of the hardware support below, below the software to make sure that these provide more assurance, which is a logical step, of course. Now, the thing that we wanted to uh, discuss here is what can you do as a manufacturer without having, imposing too much on the, on the client. Of course, these hardware-specific things all rely on the client having, having available this hardware, having the necessary operating systems to support that these kind of things. So it becomes harder and harder as a manufacturer to actually apply these techniques without involving the client as well. Um, so um, what we uh, discussed today is uh, protection, software protection against four important threats. So uh, analysis, tampering, copying, and use. Um, Software-only protection, as we discussed before, it often boils down to a rat race. If you look at obfuscation techniques, if you look at licensing techniques, these kind of techniques, is often a rat race between attackers and, and defenders. Uh, it's just a matter of buying time. That's, but it will be broken eventually. That's, that's kind of the, the idea behind it. But as I said before, it's still, it's still interesting to use them. Because um, if you're buying time of, let's say, a year or two years, it might be enough to produce your software, ship it to clients, and in two years you might ship another version to the clients, and so you have, you have protected your software in a time span of that two years. So that's the idea behind the, useful, uh, the practical use of these, of these softwares. Uh, many protection techniques are commercially available. There's definitely a number that aren't, but uh, the, 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 most of the techniques that we've discussed here are actually uh, commercially available. Um, what, they, what is often uh, advised against for crypto, rolling your own crypto library, um, is maybe not always here, uh, is, is not as strong a statement for software protection, in the sense that um, the protection of your software is kind of inversely proportional to the popularity. So the more a particular technique is used, the more uh, um, um, uh, perceivable it is that it will be broken somehow. And what a lot of these, what some of the techniques do, for instance, for obfuscation, you typically can configure those, uh, the, the products for obfuscation with your own rules. And you can say, okay, I have this library of 10 obfuscation techniques that I can use, and you can put yourself, uh, together yourself your own yeah, specific way of, of uh, putting those different techniques together to, to, to obfuscate, obfuscate the code. So the more uh, standard uh, protect, software protection techniques that you use, yeah, the, the, the more people will look at it and the, 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 the easier it will, be, it will become to, to break it in some sense. So it's still uh, it's the, same, the, the same statement as for crypto holds, but it's a bit less strong here, I would say, than, than for crypto. For crypto, we know it's always a bad idea to invent your own, your, your, invent your own crypto schemes. 
Um, we haven't had, really had the time to discuss this, but in, in practice we see a lot of combinations of different techniques. There's some uh, explanation of that in the slides as well. Uh, we see that both in the commercial products, they kind of combine different techniques to make it stronger, and that's actually what they do. Uh, the combi combined different techniques is not only a 1.1 one one is 2, but the 1.1 one one gives you more than 2, because they're actually uh, protecting each other, uh, the, the other technique as well. So it's not just two isolated techniques that you're using, but it can be the case if you're using obfuscation and watermarking, let's say, that the obfuscation is actually strengthening the watermarking uh, protection technique in itself as well. So in that sense, the combination gives you more advantages than just using them in an isolated mode. Um, okay, that's uh, what we want to discuss. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions that you can, that you want to have here, yeah? Uh -huh. The payloads are encrypted. Mm -hmm. There's a lesson to be taken from state sponsored actors where they, they, don't, they do not want you to look into what that specific payload is. Exactly, so exactly. The key is somehow separate from the, from the actual malware, mm -hmm. and it's typically some identified feature of the target so that that malware cannot be analyzed yeah. without, without the target. Yeah, 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 definitely, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions, remarks? Okay, thanks a lot, and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll go for lunch.